right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Delighted to welcome back Dom Melly, who is in Sydney, Australia. How are you doing, Dom? I'm, uh, I'm good, John. Yeah, very well. Thank you. Yeah, and for those of you who have uh, who have not been to Australia or not been to Sydney, um, maybe if you're on the east coast of the states or you're somewhere else, you know where it's cold and Christmassy and snow is coming down. Well, one time I was in Sydney for for the holidays and got to watch the Santas coming in on jet skis and everybody in t-shirts and shorts. So it's it's a great it's a great experience, but a, a very different one for many people. But then again, I'm in California, so I mean, wearing shorts on Christmas Day is not unheard of either. <laughs> All right. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today is the death of professional services firms. And uh, well, let's get straight into it, Dom. Uh, for those people who are listening and watching who are from professional services firms, tell them why they're doomed. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a really important point that you say, the, the audience for this. And, and I wanted to stress that that where as well, I mean, my business, people at their best, is very much ensconced in, in professional services. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. We're a knowledge-based organisation that relies on its technical expertise. So I think it's important to stress, John, that this is not about criticising the industry, but more about shining a light on it and yeah. thinking that there must be ways that we can do better, that we can all do better. And for me, that means how can we add value? And that's something I've been thinking about and, and obviously have a vested interest in. Uh, why is it that the industry does not create value for its clients or for society? So that, that, that's where it really started. How can we do better? We must do better. And I think if we want to maintain relevance, if we want to seat at the table, uh, if we want to add value to, our, to the market and to our clients, then a different approach is needed. So I think that's what we can really explore. What is that different approach? Yeah, so why is it then do you think that professional services uh, organizations run the risk of, of being irrelevant? I mean, because in some ways, I mean, people have a perception. When you say professional services, they, people often think, oh, oh God, how much is this going to cost me? <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. How much is it going to cost me for this product? A absolutely. Uh, John, maybe if I can just tell you a, a very, very brief story. It sort of goes like this. A customer or a client will come to a professional services firm and say, can you do X, Y, or Z? Yeah. And, and normally the, the, the consultant will say, absolutely, we can do that. We've got experience in that area. We've got expertise in that area. We're better than our competitors in that area. They agree on a scope, a budget, a time frame, and then that product, that service is delivered. And what we know is that it's a pretty underwhelming experience uh, mm -hmm. for the customer. And we know that because the satisfaction uh, levels are really low. So customer satisfaction in the industry right. is really low. And the churn rate is unnecessarily high. And, and I really started struggling with this, John, because I'm thinking, well, they've delivered on time, on scope, in budget. What's the problem? Mm -hmm. And I think that the real issue here is that the, the industry is still set up where value resides in that service that's been delivered. And you and I know, and we talked about this last time, that the substitution of products and services is taking place for experiences where people want to experience something more, something that gives them meaning, something that they value. And the industry isn't set up to deliver that. Unfortunately, I think that the expertise, the knowledge of the consultant is actually a psychological handbrake because they, they feel that the value resides in that knowledge and in that expertise. And in the connected age or the concept age, it simply doesn't value resides in the experience that's created between two people and that's a real big shift and it demands that organizations actually turn themselves inside out and upside down and operate in a very different way so we've been talking a lot about how does the operating model need to change or pivot so that uh, firms 
or consultancies can deliver an experience which is actually valued by the customer and they're willing to pay for. And I, and I think that's a great point that you made there, Dom, because I don't think, in, and as you said, I think the model has always been like, if I'm, if I'm a consultant or if I'm a professional services, I feel like my role and my persona has to be the one of the expert. And that's where, uh, and you're not going to pay me unless I can sort of make you feel like you don't know as much as I know. And I know way more than you. However, as you said, that's not a really, that's not a very satisfying experience at the end of the day. It's not, but John, it was perfectly valid in the uh, industrial age or the information age where, mm -hmm. particularly in the information age where we saw an explosion of these consultancies, uh, these professional services firms, they were paid very well. They were awarded handsomely for pumping out huge amounts of data. And last mm -hmm. year, data overtook oil as the world's most valuable asset. The problem is, <laughs> We're paying a lot for this data, more than for any other asset on the planet, but we don't value it. In fact, less than 10% of this data that's being produced is actually used to inform decision making. So whilst it's valuable, it's not really valued. And I think that what's going to be important in the future, John, and we all know that businesses are now competing on experience, customer experience, mm -hmm. but I think more importantly, it won't be who knows the most. And in the past, it was about who knows the most. It'll be about who can learn the quickest and who can use those insights to actually build bespoke, different services that the client actually values. And that requires a skill set and an approach that's, that's very different. I, I always like to talk about uh, Henry Ford, who said, if I'd listened to what my customers wanted, I'd still be trying to invent faster horses. <laughs> There's a real problem here that, uh, more importantly, and, and that might be apocryphal what, what, what uh, Ford said, but I think more interestingly is Einstein. And this is the crux of the problem, John. Einstein said if I had a really difficult problem, and we all have to accept that we're in a really challenging, yeah, volatile, and uncertain true. time. If I've got a really difficult problem, I'd spend 50 and an hour to solve it, I'd spend 55 minutes talking about the right questions to ask, trying to identify what the real problem is, and five minutes on the solution. And I think that inquiry solution ratio is back to front for most businesses. There is an imperative for most businesses to simply accept what the customer is saying they want and rush to a solution which they can then invoice for. And I think part of that, John, is the way that performance and success is measured is very internally focused, you know, revenue, profit, whatever yeah. it is. Whereas I think what's required and what we try to do at People at Their Best is that we measure our performance based on the impact on the customer. So are we actually delivering something that makes a difference to the customer and helps their world to improve. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a fundamental shift or turning inside out of the way we operate. So we operate to learn and then use that learning to help our clients. Yeah, and I think that's such a, and I think it's such an important point that you raise here, Dom, is the, the is this whole idea of of the experience exchange, and the fact is that this is how things were traditionally traditionally set up, and I do think that part of it is, uh, as you said, is I mean what the work you do, do, you know, it's very much outcome based, and you know that's how that's how you um, you know measure and, and get paid on what you do and all of that. Um, whereas a lot of people, it's almost the, you know, they, they kind of sell the process as opposed to the outcome. And then they always have the get out of jail card, right? To say, to say, well, it's how you implement it. It's how you sustain it afterwards. It's all the stuff you do. So, Hey, here's an inter it's always an interesting one. Hey, Mr. Customer, it didn't fail because anything I did, it failed because you're crap. <laughs> I can't agree with you more. You know, John, that one of the things that I, I think is important here is that the approach that you just described, that's really an order taker. And I think that yeah. people working within professional services are much better than that and want to be much better than that. 
when you're an order taker, someone asks you for something, you deliver it. If there's any problem, you wash your hands of responsibility and say it's their fault. The real problem here was the fallacy of thinking that whatever you supplied was going to be of value because that's not where value resides. Value resides in the experience that the customer has when they interact with you. Unfortunately, most of these firms believe that if they deliver a great product, they'll build a great relationship. It does not work that way. I'm here to tell you it doesn't work that way. You have to have a great relationship before you can deliver a great service because you have to understand what the client actually values. And in rushing to provide a solution, which is really just to deliver the order that's been placed by that customer, we're actually missing out on understanding what the real problem is that needs to be fixed. And I think there's three things at the moment in this world where everything can be copied, can be replicated, is being automated or being outsourced. I think if professional services firms and the consultants that work within there, within them, if they, if they rest on their expertise and knowledge to create value, then they've got a tough future ahead of them. You know, their relevance has been eroded really quickly because what they traditionally did as I said, is being outsourced or automated yeah. uh, at an alarming rate. And, and Oxford University talks about the hollowing out of work and pretty much say that anyone that relies on their knowledge uh, for their relevance is pretty much going to be irrelevant within the decade because that yeah. work will be... Sorry, John, just... And, I, and this is where I, this is where I um, care deeply about it. It's hubris for me to think that anything that I do, any of my knowledge is somehow of exceptional value. Everything I do can be, can be easily and readily accessed on the internet for free. You know, my knowledge base has been commodified really quickly. So there's got to be something more and it's in the experience that we create when we interact with our customers. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And I think one of the other things that you touched upon there that I think is incredibly important is this idea of educating. Because at the end of the day, um, if we engage with the professional services organization, we, it's not just hiring your expertise, we want some of that expertise, we want to learn from it. So the, if it's a learning and education experience, it's, to be honest, the chances of, of you coming back or us having you come back again is so much higher than if you sort of do it and then kind of black box it so you know I ha you, that, you, that I need you to come back. So it's better that I want you to come back as opposed to need you to come back. Absolutely. And, and John, we may have mentioned this uh, last time we spoke, but there's four monetary markers of what you just said. You know, there's that repeat purchase behavior. I keep coming back. Apart from the obvious ones, which is loyalty or stickiness and, and, and obviously share of wallet and yield. Yeah. And there's also one more, which is really important for this sector, which is word of mouth referrals, that your clients mm. become advocates for you, that they actually promote you. And that's something that's really low traditionally in professional services. And that's part of the problem. You're competing with thousands of other people who do exactly the same thing. So if you're relying on your great service, and someone else can do an equivalent level of service at a cheaper price, you know this, when people yeah. compare like with like, they'll buy on price. There has to be something more. And the really smart organizations are looking for new ways and additional ways to understand what their clients value and then use their services to serve that customer's needs. And that's a really different way, you know? So it's operating to learn about the customer and then using your services to actually service that customer. So that's a, that's a very different approach. John, I think what's really important here is that in this automated and increasingly copied or replicated world that we live in, there's really only three things that machines can't do. And that goes to your point about education. Mm -hmm. It's making someone feel valued. Machines can't do that. Demonstrating empathy so that someone feels understood. And we can't, we can't minimise how important that is. You know, people that feel understood are more likely to trust you. People that trust you are more likely to buy from you. And the third thing is, to your point, John, 
is making sense of our increasing complexity, making sense of uncertainty. If you can actually engage in a conversation where someone starts to make sense of their problems or the future that they want to create, then that's how you add value. So empathy or making someone feel understood, making someone feel valued. And that's through a discussion that you actually take the time to, to hear what they have to say, to understand their problems, and then to sort of start to create that pathway to a better future. And at the end of the day, people buy for two reasons. They have a problem they don't want and want to get rid of, or they want a reality they don't have but want. You know, So if you can help to start to define that and to make them feel enabled or capable of moving towards that, and that's your value proposition. And that comes from the interaction between two people. Now, as Brian Cox, the particle physicist, said that, you know, true, true breakthroughs, true understanding requires more than one brain. It's two people coming together and collaborating. And in the past, I think that the relationship was one way. It was the expert giving you some knowledge. Yeah, you know, no, I... You I, I, I I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that what you said there is it's really a conversation between equals. You're both bringing different knowledge to the equation. You're bringing it together. The customer obviously has the institutional knowledge, has the need, understands how things work. You have the knowledge of working with various other companies, maybe solving this problem. And together you partner to create the solution. But it's a meeting of equals. And to your point, it's a recognition that Without both of you, you're not going to come to an optimum solution. Yeah, in the um, information and industrial age, the participation between the buyer and the supplier was really low. It was one way. And that's okay because it was a transaction and value resided in that product. We've moved on from that. Value resides in the experience that someone has. Do they learn something? Do they discover something? Do they feel valued? Uh, what I'm sure you know this, John, but you know, 70% of the buying experience is based on how people feel. It has nothing yeah. to do with the product, yeah. nothing yeah. at all. And nine out of 10 people would actually pay more for something if they felt they were having a better experience. Mm -hmm. So people are willing to pay more. So that's where our value has to be in creating that experience where people feel valued, where they start to make sense of this increasingly difficult world. And I think if anything, uh, has come out of COVID, it's this real understanding that the traditional operating model and thinking that the solutions, the suite of products and services that professional services traditionally delivered to their customers simply aren't fit for purpose anymore. The world is changing far too quickly. The interactions are far too complex to think that any solution is going to be right, you know? And at the end of the day, it's about understanding the customer better than anyone else so that you can tailor, we talk about extreme experimentation. You know, we talk about bespoke services, building things that haven't been delivered before. Obviously that cuts into your margin, but what we found is that the, those four monetary markers go up, you know, so our share of wallet, repeat purchase mm -hmm. behavior, referrals to other customers, they all go up. So your margin goes down because you actually build something new. It's not an off the shelf standardized product, but the four monetary markers means that we're doing much, much better. I think what's really important, John, is this concept of demand creation. Yeah. And in that product centric model, what you're trying to do is find more and more customers to flog your products to. You know, we've moved away from that, John. It's about finding new ways to serve the customers that we've got. Yeah. And, that, and that's, I think that's a really important shift. Yeah. And I think if, any, if anything, going into 2021, if we've learned anything, not just from this year, from the pandemic, but I think it was happening anyway, yep. is, that, yep. is that people want more engagement. They want more humanization in the, product. They want, in the process. They want more collaboration. Um, they want more partnering and teamwork. Uh, and I think there's a, and I think the, pandemic to be honest has accentuated that now and i think going into 2021 um, you'll do yourself a big favor if you start to look at how do i engage more deeply how do i you know how am i more how can i be more collaborative how can i be um how can i differentiate myself through the experience like you said of really really engaging with uh, customers 
John, I um, always quote uh, Jerry Garcia, the uh, lead guitarist of The Grateful yeah. Dead, and, and, and he said, don't try and be the best at what you do. And that's traditionally been the value proposition of professional services firms. They say they have better quality than anyone else. And that's fine when value resided in that product or service. That's fine. But what Garcia said is, don't try to be the best at what you do. Try and do what no one else can do. And I think that's the really important point, that if you're able to provide an experience and understand what the clients value, then you'll be able to serve them better than anyone else because no one will understand their needs like you do. And that requires you to double the amount of time that you actually spend talking about what their needs are. Now, we talk about fall in love with the problem and let the solution be co-created through that collaboration between the two parties. And, and that takes you in, in directions that you could never imagine. And that's the scary part for most experts because mm -hmm. they like to define their area of expertise and they like to be able to standardize it, which allows you to scale. This is a very different approach. This is about getting someone to buy a relationship with you rather than buy into your products because that's not where your value is and you're competing with too many people. Yeah. So and, we keep also, talking about demand creation where we're untapping new needs, we're untapping new problems to be fixed, ones that the customer don't, that aren't even aware of. And that's really exciting. That's where the cream is. That's where all the meaningful work is. That's where the exciting opportunities are. Rather than simply trying to win more market share by competing with your customers, we're talking about creating new market share, creating things that didn't, current, didn't uh, previously exist. So that emerging market. But to do that, you need to take a leaf out of Einstein's book and really spend time trying to understand what is the problem here that needs fixing? What will transform the customer's world? Mm. And, and, sorry, John, to repeat it again, because I think it's really important. There's only really three things that technology can't do for you now. So all of those services that uh, uh, professional services traditionally did are being automated. So you might as well focus on the things that can't be delivered by machines now, which is making sense of the world, making yeah. sense of complexity, making someone feel valued, making someone feel understood. You know, I think at the heart of all of this, John, is, is empathy and really understanding what it is that will make a difference and have an impact on our customer. And I think that there's seven, we've defined it as the seven antecedents or ingredients of empathy. And that's that curiosity, asking questions, the courage to ask questions and say you don't know and try to explore, to collaborate, put the customer at the center, to care about their outcomes, you know, that real curiosity and consciousness. Mm -hmm. So the seven C's of empathy which actually allow you to create an experience that's truly valued by your customers and they'll keep coming back and they'll spend more with you. They'll refer you to others. You know, that's a really exciting world, I think. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. And I think, I think that's a, it's a great note to end on, Don. We're just out of time now. Um, all of Don's information will be in the, in his contributor bio below. Uh, uh, and uh, listen, Dom, this has been fantastic. I mean, I think it's really great insights for people going into 2021, Thanks, John. particularly in this industry. Um, my name is John Golden, Says Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeline of CRM. I will see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you.